uh, overhead myth, new tools and strategies. Um, today we are working with um, GuideStar and a nonprofit assistance fund. But before we get started, uh, as you all know, I usually have a little bit of a um, housekeeping to go through here. Sorry. Just to let everybody know, we were a little bit late getting on this morning because we do have a little bit of an audio issue. There is some clicking that uh, appears every now and then. It's periodic. We're going to try to keep that to a minimum, but we apologize in advance for that. So today's webcast, as usual, is brought to you by 501C Agencies Trust. Uh, we're the nation's oldest unemployment program, and we welcome everybody to the webcast. Many of you are already working with us, and we thank you for that relationship. And we hope to have a great uh, year with our webcast again. Now a little bit of housekeeping. So if you have any questions, everybody knows how to use the questions box uh, in the GoToWebinar Web application. We will be answering questions throughout as well as at the end. So if Dave or Kurt is talking about puppies and you have a specific question about puppies, don't hesitate to shoot that in there and we'll try to talk about it while we're talking about puppies before we move on to cats. Um, today's broadcast is also being recorded. Um, it will be available on demand about an hour following it, uh, following the conclusion. Everybody will get a copy of that. Then we, we also post them on YouTube so you can share that with your friends and family. Um, we do have a number of attachments. Uh, a copy of the slides is in the attachments area. And also we have some information from GuideStar down there so you can go ahead and download that stuff. And don't forget we do have future web, webcasts um, that we will be um, featuring every month uh, for the rest of the year. We do have a pretty big one next month, um, so you'll see details about that at the end. So before we get started, I'm going to go ahead and induce our panelists today, a very attractive bunch, I might add, uh, Gabe and Kurt. Gabe is the Senior Director of Marketing and Communications for GuideStar. Uh, that's the world's, lar world's largest hub of information about nonprofit organizations. Uh, he's the project lead for major GuideStar initiatives, including the Overhead Myth, which we're talking about today, uh, GuideStar for grant applications, and encouraging nonprofits to keep their uh, nonprofit profiles updated on GuideStar. That's very important. So um, he will talk about that, I'm sure. Uh, Kurt, is a, Kurt is a CPA and he's the finance director for the Nonprofit Assistance Fund. Um, he uh, joined uh, the Nonprofit Assistance Fund giving him a, a perfect opportunity to share his passion for nonprofit finance every day. He has 30 years of experience in the sector, and uh, we look forward to hearing from him uh, also today. So, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Gabe. Gabe, you should have control. Uh, go ahead and take away. Yeah, hey, thanks, Mac, and thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, and. I'd just like to start off, I've given this presentation kind of all over at this point, or some variation of it anyway, and I'd like to start talking about a little bit why I give this presentation. And the reason for that is that um, I look at this as an opportunity for to preach to the choir. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is that I want to take an opportunity to share what I know sitting at GuideStar uh, with you as the nonprofits out there that are doing good in the world. And the reason for that is that preaching to the choir actually arms the choir with arguments and elevates the choir's discourse. There's a great quote that I saw one time and I've tried to include in most of my presentations that I've given, but I hope that I help uh, arm you with some different information that you can use as you go to battle the overhead myth through your work. So with that, I'm going to jump into our agenda. Um, and again, apologies, I'm, I'm hearing the clicking too, so apologies if you are, but uh, we're just going to keep moving through it. So uh, we're going to start with talking about the problem behind overhead ratios. Then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the campaign that we ran, uh, the overhead myth campaign. From there, we'll move on to how we can actually fight the myth. So with that, let's start by talking about the problem. Um, Simply put, the problem is that simplistic financial ratios have become a dominant proxy for nonprofit performance, right? We all know this. Uh, we hear constantly our own organizations being judged by this, this overly simplistic financial ratio and not by the difference that we're making towards our mission. And to me, this was really crystallized last year when I got this email from really one of the smartest friends that I have. Um, and I, I love this sentence in his email 
that I have highlighted here. I'm hoping to maximize my charitable bank for my buck, looking for low overhead organizations, I think. Right? So this is great. We've all heard this. Um, at Thanksgiving dinner last year, my uncle John was asking me for low overhead ratios, uh, low overhead organizations. It's the number one thing that I hear when I tell people that I work at GuideStar. Um, and we are trying to come up with a set of tools at GuideStar to help combat this. And I, I love that my friend was at least willing to come to the table and say, I think, right? He wasn't 100% sure that that's what he wanted because he does want uh, to maximize his charitable bang for the buck. So simply put, a low overhead ratio does not equal an effective organization. What my friend was looking for is someone that is making a difference fighting the missions that he cares about, um, and not necessarily just what are being counted as administrative costs when it comes to your 990. And we do this in with because we don't have other information to judge our organizations on, right? You would never judge a for-profit organization based on their overhead. This is a, a great slide that I like to, to share with people about the average service industry uh, overhead uh, as it comes to some different for-profit organizations out there, but they have a different financial metric which we judge them by, and that is profit. Um, so we don't need to use that, and we don't need to use overhead ratio, uh, but in the nonprofit sector, we don't have a single metric that we're gonna be able to use. Um, so instead, we've defaulted to this, this financial ratio that really is not a good proxy for performance. So let's talk a little bit about the reason of why that is. Um, and there's lots of blame to go around. Uh, nonprofit rating and information agencies, I'm gonna come back to this one. Nonprofits themselves, you guys out there making a difference in the world. Uh, donors, uh, both institutional and indi individual, journalists and government entities. But let's focus on that top one a little bit. And um, I'd, I'd like to share this slide with you as a way to, to call ourselves and myself out for working at GuideStar and for being that blue crayon a little bit. Um, up until a few years ago, this is what our profiles on GuideStar looked like. And you can see there circled in the bottom left is uh, an overhead pie chart. And uh, I'm excited that Kurt is really gonna address this head on later as to just how damaging this is. Um, but we did this at GuideStar because we were basing all of our information um, up until a, a, a recent point on uh, data that was coming from the 990. We were the first ones to really make that information publicly available. It started as a book all the way back in 1996. It moved to a CD-ROM, I believe, in uh, something like 1999, and then a, a website thereafter. Um, but we had nothing else to use, right? And so in, in lieu of that, um, we created these expense uh, pie charts and showing the fundraising and administrative, administrative costs. So we no longer do that at GuideStar, but it's because up until recently, this is what we were basing our, our, or our profiles on. And I'm gonna get into a little bit why that's not the case now. Um, but I do just like to share this slide. This is the sort of information that we were judging your organization on and every organization on. The 1.4 million active nonprofits out there were being judged by this sort of a document. But that's why uh, in 2014, we started a campaign with the Better Business Bureau's Wise Giving Alliance and Charity Navigator. Um, and it was called the Overhead Myth Campaign. Uh, we started this campaign by releasing an open letter to the donors of America. I hope that some of you have seen this letter before. If not, go to overheadmyth.com and you can get everything that I'm about to talk about can be found there. But in this letter, we talked to the donors of America and we told them why it is um, such a plague to our industry and really to, to doing more good uh, that we're focusing solely on overhead ratios. Uh, and the three organizations banded together. We were some of the ones that really proliferated this myth up until that point. And so we wanted to be the ones to try to change the conversation. A pretty successful campaign that we ran. Uh, we had over 3,000 individuals sign a pledge to stop focusing on overhead ratios. We had hundreds of media mentions um, and tens of thousands of people have visited the site to find out more. The next year, we launched a second letter, and that letter was to the nonprofits of America. Uh, and, and that was to you all, the people that are on the line today, uh, talking about the part that you can play 
in uh, changing the conversation. We called it moving towards an overhead solution. Um, and I'm going to get into some of the, the resources and some of the, the action items that came out of this, this note in, um, next, but I, I do just like to go back to these letters. We feel as though we started to change the conversation. To be completely candid, we think that inside the sector, when I'm talking to people like Mac and I'm talking to people like Kurt and I'm talking to you all, the nonprofits of America, we've, we, we know that we've started to change the conversation there. And we've started to get that message across to nonprofits about changing um, the way that they talk about the difference that their organizations are making. But we don't know if we're making a great difference when it comes to, to my friend that wrote me that email or my uncle John that asked me for low overhead organizations at Thanksgiving last year. We're not sure if we're changing the conversation there. So that's where we're focused right now as we move forward. So let's start talking about that. Let's start talking about how we're going to fight that myth. Um, and with that, the first thing that I want to share with you all is that to let you know that you're not alone. These are just some of the organizations out there that are really working on fighting this myth. Um, this list is growing all of the time. Uh, the nonprofit, I'm sorry, I think Forefront out of Chicago is actually the one that put together this slide and we just love it. Uh, it shows so eloquently all of the different groups that are coming together to fight this. So know that you're not alone and um, there are plenty of organizations out there that are, that are looking to make a difference in the world. So what can you do as a nonprofit uh, to help this conversation? And it starts by demonstrating your ethical practice and sharing data about your performance, right? So that's a twofold. We're gonna come back to this a little bit, but you can't share your data without getting trust from the organization, it, without getting trust from your stakeholders and with your donors. Um, the next thing is that you need to make sure that you're managing towards results. And then after that, you need to educate funders on the real cost of those results. So let's dive into that a little bit. And let's start with our first action item of the day. And that is to demonstrate ethical practice. We think a really easy way that you can do that is by going to the Better Business Bureau's Wise Giving Alliance. That website is give.org and getting accredited. So I just wanna talk a little bit about what that means. Um, Better Business Bureau has come up with a set of 22 different standards that they evaluate organizations against. Those standards are broken down into governance and oversight, measuring effectiveness, finances, which goes way beyond the overhead ratios, and then fundraising and informational materials as well. And that includes complaints, right? They are part of Better Business Bureau. So that comes in at that point. Um, if you haven't had a chance to get your organization accredited, we do recommend going there as a, as a good action item. The next thing that I want to talk about today is, is getting a platinum seal of transparency on GuideStar, right? So this is a lot of what I spend my time doing, but um, let's talk about what exactly that means. And to talk about that, I'm going to use a few different metaphors here. Um, when you're creating a story to overcome the overhead myth, uh, you need to create a story that has three different factors going for it. The first is that it needs to be multidimensional. The second is that it needs to be familiar to donors. And the third, that it needs to be standardized and efficiently distributed across the sectors. So what does that mean? And, and let's start with that multidimensional factor. And let's talk a little bit about how we pick restaurants. I was in uh, Santa Barbara for an event a few weeks ago, talking to a group of nonprofits out there. And um, I got in the night before, never been to Santa Barbara ever, uh, and I wanted to find a restaurant. So one of my colleagues recently graduated from UCSB, the college there in town. Um, so I asked her for a few recommendations. Uh, and she gave me um, three or four different recommendations around town, depending on what I was looking for. But then I couldn't end there, right? I had to then go to Yelp and see what other people are saying and see what that star rating was um, and to check out the menu and what was recommended. So look at all of the different ways that we could think about which restaurants we choose to go to. Maybe it's nutritional quality or, or organic food, farm to table, right? That's something that we all are looking at more and more when we're looking at um, picking a restaurant or Facebook. Right? Our friends' recommendations. We all love going to Facebook and, and, and seeing what our friends have recommended. And Yelp, just like I just said, we want to see what an aggregate is saying about an organization and look at that just over that, that nice and simple star rating. So, what about with nonprofit organizations? Let's look at some of the things that we have in place to, to tell the full story of an organization. 
we've got great nonprofits, an, an organization that leads to, uh, that gives, that allows you to give reviews, allows your beneficiaries to give reviews on your organization. We've got the BBB Wise Giving Alliance. We've got our platinum information, which I'm going to dive into, and Charity Navigator, and, and we still have Facebook, of course. Um, so it's going to take lots of different information. And when we try to simplify evaluating an organization by one little factor, we're doing a disservice to our own organizations. We're more complex than that. We're more than just a simple financial ratio. The next, and, and, and what we are, you can, cut, you can start to group those different types of, of information into programmatic, uh, both quantitative and qualitative organ, uh, information, financial data, operational data, and then that external data, the external perspectives, the Yelps of the nonprofit, if you will. And so we need to take that information and we need to package it into something familiar so that donors who may not be doing this on a day in and day out basis, Maybe they're donating four different times a year to, to charities. They can understand it. So we like to use the example of a, a nutrition facts label. And could we create something like a nonprofit facts um, label? And I, I like to blur this out. Let's not take this too seriously, OK? Every time I give this presentation, someone says, this is great. That's the answer right there. But it's really not. It's a little bit too simplistic. We're a bit more complicated than that. But let's feed off that and let's think about how we can take that information that's multidimensional and it's familiar and we can efficiently distribute it throughout the sector. So I like to use the metaphor of shipping containers. Um, these shipping containers, if you're not familiar with them, every time you see uh, an 18 wheeler driving down the road, that's what they're carrying. But it's not just 18 wheelers, it's these jumbo cargo ships and trains and these, these transport the goods all the way around the world. Right, And so there's two different factors to that. There's the fact that they can be efficiently distributed, but there's a standard set of specifications that makes them so that they can be efficiently distributed. So we need to do that in the nonprofit sector. And one of the ways that we've done that at GuideStar is we've created our data distribution network that we call it. It is more than uh, 200 different companies, organizations, websites, applications that are using our data to populate their charitable giving platforms, to populate their research on nonprofits, to populate um, their donor advised funds or their universities. And so the information that lives on GuideStar doesn't just stay in GuideStar, it really does go all over the world. And let's take a look at what that information is. And we're going to use our seals of transparency to have that conversation. It starts with basic information with our bronze seal of transparency so you can be found. And then financial information about your organization so that you can be trusted. Gold information, which is the, the qualitative informa information behind how you're making a difference. These are our charting impact questions. We worked with BBB Wise Giving Alliance, an independent sector on these, to create five questions that are the narrative behind how you're making a difference. And then that last one is, is the platinum information. Um, and that platinum information is the numbers behind how you're making a difference. If you're a homeless shelter, how many beds did you open up last year? Uh, if you're a Habitat for Humanity, how many families did you take off the street that were living in substandard housing? Uh, if you're an advocacy organization, how many lawmakers did you meet with? It's both outcomes and outputs um, that start to tell uh, the story in a numerical format. And with that, we've packaged it all into our new nonprofit profiles. So you can see as this video scrolls through, a ton of different information is available out there. Your results and progress information, your financial information that does not have overhead ratios, but does have more interesting financial metrics like months of cash or liquidity rate. Uh, and then your operational information. Uh, and so all of that information is available to the public and to the 7 million people who are coming to GuideStar each year to look at your organization. So make sure as an action item, go check out your profile on GuideStar and then start updating it if you don't have that platinum seal of transparency. To do that, you can go to guidestar.org backslash update. The next action item here is to strive to make a lasting impact uh, and to understand your true costs. So I, I cheated a little bit here and I'm gonna package a bunch of different resources into one place and that's overheadmyth.com backslash resources. Go check out that website and you're gonna get a whole list of different resources that can help you do this. Um, let's, I'm gonna go through just a few of these, but let's start with that strive to make a lasting impact. Um, great 
resources that you're seeing on your screen now, uh, Leap, of Reason, Leap of Reason and the Performance Imperative, a uh, great book that you can get out there, started by Mario Marino, Mario Marino and, and about 40 different Leap of Reason ambassadors that have come together to, to talk about how you manage the outcomes. Uh, lean Impact Principles, and then Zeroing in, in on Impact, a great article that was in SSIR. You can find links to all of this information again on overheadmyth.com backslash resources. Next, let's understand your true costs. And um, Nonprofit Finance Fund has some great resource, resources on this, as does Forefront and AICPA's Audit and Accounting, and Accounting Guide for Nonprofits. So there's just some of the places that you can go. Um, and once you understand those two true costs, the last thing is that you really need to help educate your funders on the real costs of those results. So I want to tell a little bit of a story. We recently had a, a webinar um, on GuideStars platform, and I hope some of you were able to attend that webinar. And we had some uh, great guests. One of the guests that we had that day was uh, Vu Le, who runs the prolific blog nonprofits with balls and if you haven't check and checked it out before I really do encourage you to do that but um, Vu writes passionately about the subject of about how we need to over uh, overcome the overhead myth uh, he just had a new blog out there today uh, but one of the things that he said before is that we need to change the way that we talk about it and, and this is going to parlay pretty nicely I think into what Kurt's talking about but we ran a poll on that um, that webinar that we had and we just asked people what do you think we should call overhead? And the options that we put up there were core costs, uh, operational costs, overhead, Voulet's option, which I, I love this option and, and I'm gonna quote it here. It's things we need to do, things we need in order to do our job of helping people, damn it. Or the last option was the ubiquitous other. So um, not really surprisingly, core costs came in at over 50% was the one that was selected overwhelmingly as the favorite that we can start to change that conversation. So there, there is a, an aspect here, just how we talk about it amongst ourselves on this call, when you're talking to donors, when you're talking to your foundation funders, stop referring to it as overhead and start referring to it as something that's a little bit closer to what that is. And, and so we like to use core costs. The second story that I want to tell from that webinar, from another webinar that we had recently on the subject matter, um, is from Dominique Bernardo, who is the CFO and she was the, the acting CEO of Congresso up in Philadelphia. She um, told the story about how she did this at her organization. And I, I like to share this story just because it, it, there's a bluntness to it that I really like. So the first thing that she did being the CFO is that she went back and she did the calculations to find out just how much her real costs were and her indirect costs were. And she then went to each of her funders and she looked at how much they were paying her in terms of indirect costs in their organization. And maybe it was 8%, maybe it was 10%, maybe if it was really lucky, it was 15%. So most of the time her indirect costs were ending up at um, in the 20, 25, 30% range. And she simply wrote an email to each of her funders that said, I'd like to let you know that our indirect costs are 25% and you're currently paying us 8%. She had numerous funders come back to her and just said, we're so sorry about this. We didn't know we'd like to increase the amount that we're paying towards your indirect costs. And it's pretty crazy to think about this one little anecdote that she just simply did the calculations, wrote this email very respectfully, respectfully to her funders and how much change came out of that. So I just like to use that as an anecdote. Um, as, as we go on, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand it over to Kurt now, um, but remember you can play a difference in this. And, and the foundations that I talked to, I was at a foundation conference two weeks ago out in LA, um, and I probably talked to a hundred different grants managers there who all said, please, we want to hear from your nonprofits. We want to hear from the nonprofits about the struggles and how we can make their lives better. So, so don't be shy um, and, and go out there and, and spread the word. With that, I will hand it over to Kurt. All right, Kurt, I gave you control. You should be able to, to take control of the slides now. You might want to make sure you unmute yourself, though.
Kurt, are you there? We can't hear you. Is your line muted? All right, we appear to have lost Kurt. Gabe, we have a couple of questions we can talk to um, while Kurt tries to get logged back on. I'll try to get logged back on here. So um, let me pull these up here. Here's one uh, from Colleen. In terms of true costs, uh, can, you can you clarify how indirect or overhead is calculated when a significant portion of revenue and expenses, and you can read along with me in the questions tab, are passed through to, to a contractor? Uh, pass through does, doesn't mean no work. In fact, the contract management and payment process is significant. We've heard overhead should be based on full revenue and expenses but on our operating budget only. Can you uh, answer Colleen's question there? Well, that, that that's a toughie for me, and, and I, I hope that Kirk can join us soon because I think that he may actually be better positioned to answer the, the specificity of that question. Um, and, and, and this, you know, I think the question gets to a larger problem that we're having as a sector right now, and that is we don't have good definitions for these things from an accounting level and also from a more of a kind of conversation and cultural level. We don't necessarily know what one organization is using to count towards their overhead ratio compared to what another organization is using. So um, I, I think Kurt may be back here. So I'm going to see if Kurt wants to maybe take take the ball and, and, and run with it. Kurt, are you there? <laughs> uh, maybe not. There's always a chance that he's talking and doesn't realize that we can't hear him. Yeah. Um, but that, that's certainly, uh, Colleen, that, that's, it's a really good question and it's something that some of our colleagues at uh, places like the Nonprofit Assistance Fund, the Nonprofits Finance Fund, um, and as well as Bridgespan is another group that's doing really good work to try to define exactly what should go in these ratios. Uh, once we do that, then we can start to have more of an apples to apples comparison across organizations as to why is one organization's uh, true indirect costs or overhead ratio or core costs or whatever we want to call it. Why is one organization so high and another organization so low? That's a much more. Can, uh... Oh, there he is. Hey, Kurt. Yeah. There he is. Hey. He's back. There is the, uh, the classic reboot. If something's not working, just try it over again. So here we are. So, <laughs> all right. Well, Gabe, good, good. do you want to finish about that, that everyone? Oh, yeah, oh no, I'm, uh, no, I'm completely done stalling, and I'll, I'll let the experts talk now. Okay. Okay. That was a good one, and my apologies. Right. No problem. Go right ahead, sir. Take it away. Okay. Well, I can tell you that I was attentively listening the whole time Gabe was talking and actually having quite a lot of fun, and I'm, so I'm sorry about the little gap there. Um, so when I went to turn my uh, headset on, I was surprised to find out it wasn't there anymore because I was listening quite intently. Um, but, Gabe, thank you very much for the um, confession of sins about the pie chart, and here it is in all its glory. And of course, this is the place we love to start is the, re uh, the whole idea of retiring this very pie chart you mentioned. And, and I realize, and we all do that the, uh, you know, the guide star of today is not the guide star of the past. And we all have many things where we have advanced our thinking along the way. Um, certainly one of the things that we think of when we see this pie chart is this is basically the nonprofit version of the theory that the earth is flat. And, uh, you know, looking at the pie chart this way and looking at our programs, our administrative and fundraising costs, and certainly overhead and the way we have thought about it for years and years and years, has had the same effect that, um, you know, all of human history when thinking the earth is flat. If we think that is true and take it as sort of the, um, the baseline of all reality, all of our thinking flows from that, all of our science flows from that, all of our future theories flow from that, and we just can't get out of the rut. So if we think the earth is flat, we support that in everything we do. So if we think of our nonprofits and our business models and certainly overhead or the cost, I love the way um, that Gabe shared Voulet's thinking about, you know, this is just all the stuff that we need to do to do our work, damn it. Um, if we think of admin and fundraising and programs in the way that we see things here in this pie chart that is to be retired, how else could we think of 
admin and fundraising as things other than things that would diminish our programs. If this is your visual, if this is how we think, and we increase admin or fundraising in any way in this visual, there's only one thing that can happen. There, if those slices of the pie get bigger, our programs diminish. And when we think diminishment, no wonder people are still asking, even Gabe's friends and family, asking him to find out which nonprofit organizations have the smallest pieces of pie for those administrative and fundraising expenses. It also always begs us to think that somehow the program work, especially if we think of it separate from admin, fundraising, human resources, governance, all the things that uh, help us do our work day to day, if we think of programs as the real work, then those other two things, at least in this diagram, are not the real work, so they're sus suspect. Um, another way I like to think about this is if you look at uh, the way we have talked about overhead and um, our visuals of it, and the way that we think about this, um, it's basically, if you look at this pie chart, it's sort of the nonprofit equivalent of the quarterly earnings report for the publicly traded companies. This is the thing that has driven our bad thinking and our bad behavior for years. You know, the quarterly earnings report is always um, touted as the thing that keeps uh, leaders in the for-profit world striving to meet their metric which is a false metric and unfortunately a very bad one for long-term strategies and planning. But basically that quarterly metric of if we can just make sure our earnings are higher than they were the last time, and if we plan around that, then life is good and our investors will be happy and off we go. And we've seen what that has done to many companies. Not only does it affect their thinking and their strategy, but it also encourages some bad behavior, the misbehaviors who actually end up um, you know, unethically trying to influence those ratios and ways that there are, their quarterly earnings are reported so that they get a better opinion of themselves or the, that the world takes a better opinion of them and, and, and rewards them with investment. Well, in the nonprofit world, this is our version of that, where we, I, I hate to say it, but there have been actors out there who have tried to keep the admin and fundraising portions of this pie very small perhaps in not exactly transparent or accurate ways. And no wonder, we've been sort of forcing their hand, right? We've been, the scrutiny that we've put on them and the demand that we make that this admin and fundraising pieces of the pie are smaller would cause anyone, especially if there's great pressure from either investors, boards, donors, the general public to do so, they might be tempted at times to try to change the way they do their accounting or even report this out. So we think there's a better way. Because um, no matter how hard we try, this visual is not going to get us to the right place and is actually going to cause us to, to do bad planning, bad strategies, and maybe even bad accounting. So if we think about those false assumptions, these are the inaccuracies that are really supported by the overhead myth. That, that whole thing that Gabe talked about very well, that administrative and funding fundraising costs diminish investment in the program. And actually, we would see it just the counter to that. Or that somehow low administrative and fundraising costs are the indicator of an efficient nonprofit. And I love the fact that more and more information is coming out that it's actually there is no real connection between a particular fundraising or administrative cost ratio and the effectiveness of the programs of an organization. All it really does is tell us proportionally how much money that an organization has or resources are spent on those two things. But it doesn't say anything about the quality of those particular costs and resources and how they're used or the effectiveness of the programs that are supported by them. And then finally, that somehow overhead costs can even exist separately from programs. It's really the core of the myth. Um, we don't actually see them and try very hard not to talk a, about them as being separate. Um, this is in our, in our way of looking at things, what you're seeing here is really the bad science. These are all the, the theories and myths and, and um, ways of looking at the world that come out of that pie chart and are, are supported by the pie chart, pie chart, are really supported by our Earth is flat theory that we're thinking about. Okay. So if we have a different way of visioning the world instead of the old pie chart, 
and I love the fact that Kay sort of, or, uh, Gabe sort of introduced this with the you know core support or core costs coming up as one of the most um, popular ways of revisioning what those overhead costs uh, are called. The way that we have thought about this and talked about this at the Nonprofits Assistance Fund for years is right in line with that, which is in our vision of a new way of looking at how organizations are put together is that what's at the center of the organization is core mission support, fundraising, partnerships, investors, the folks who actually, with whom or without whom, this work wouldn't get done. Because those are the folks, that's where the public comes involved. You always think if we're nonprofit organizations, there's some mission that's driving us out into the world. And we often like to think that it was the brainchild of a wonderful founder somewhere and that that one person has brought this great need and and vision and insight together and, and started off with a nonprofit to go do things. But really, if there wasn't the need or if there wasn't something going on in the world, some stir that was um, out there, there wouldn't be anybody to support an idea no matter how good it was. So there always has to be this core of folks who are willing to support the work with their resources and the partnerships that come out of community, out of foundations, out of the general public, individual donors. Um, corporate support, all kinds of things. So the core we see really is the partnerships. The reason why this work is in, is going to go forward is the fact there are other people that were are going to help us with it. And around that, the other piece of core mission support are those very things that you know get today labeled as overhead as sort of the finance functions. You know, having what would it be to have really strong and strategic finance and accounting uh, available to every nonprofit? What would that do for us? Um, what about progressive human resource policies and practices, things that actually drew in the best talent in the world and supported them, brought together the most diverse and equitable uh, organizations in terms of who is on our staff and the way that those staffs are relating to and part of the very communities that they serve. What about capable and responsive board governance? What if we spent time investing in training up our boards and helping them to best support our mission and get the effectiveness of the organization um, going forward? And then finally, also, um, of course, development staff. And what if it, you know, if we were seeing that as a return on investment sort of calculation rather than, gee, we have to keep these costs very, very low because that's how the world's judging us. And I think of those things as the potential that this this new graphic brings to us as a way to think differently. There's really no defense of this needed. A strong core, if you think about any other kind of organization, any kind of other place we would think in the world, we would always think that a strong core was the basis of a good organization, of good strategy. And so we think of it this way and, and have brought this new graphic to it. I would really think of this more three-dimensionally than two-dimensionally, but I think you get the point just by looking at it this way. So if we think that the uh, new way of looking at it, this core mission support idea, where we have core mission um, support that includes our partnerships and fundraising sorts of capabilities development, human resources, finance, and then around that, as you saw in the graphic, the shared direct expenses that our organization has, all those things that are actually program related clearly. They are all about doing our work out in the world, but they're shared among many of our programs. And then finally, that outer circle was the um, direct expenses. Those things are just for one particular program. But if you think of all that as a more accurate view of a nonprofit business model, we can see that 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 graphic, this new way of, of thinking about things, actually does capture things that we already count on, like true program costs. And I love that Gabe set us up there, too, talking about the fact that there are great resources out there, including some on our own website, too, about how to capture true program costs. And that the fact that if you think of, start thinking of nonprofit overhead and nonprofits and our business models in a different way, then we start to think that investment in the infrastructure, in the, in the core of the organization, is actually an enhancement, not a diminishment of our missions. And it's a way to expand our missions. If you just, you know, I will show you here in the next slide that if you, if, if you think of expanding the core, and again, here's the, the definition of those things at that core, the strong strategic finance and accounting, human resources, board government, governance, you know, development staff, think of all those things. If they were just the best possible resources we could have for an organization, then what happens for our organizations moving forward? So think of this graphic again. 
And here we have the way that uh, it actually works. This is one of those places where um, it's not just a theory. The math actually works here. Uh, the math supports this idea of um, those expenses and resources we use at the core are shared proportionally by each of the programs that we have that are pushing out into the world to do good work. And if we would expand the core and strengthen it, it just pushes. And then again, this is um, graphically helps us do a lot of good work in our and get our, in our minds reset about the strategies that come with it. But if you expand that core, you're going to push out the direct expenses, the program specific expenses. You're going to push out programs into the world. And if we think of it that way, if you if you're investing in those areas, you're not diminishing those outer rings. You're just pushing them farther out into the world. So obviously, because every program has a whole range of costs, there's no sense, and frankly, it's it's bad thinking. It's back to the Earth is flat sort of thinking to somehow separate that core mission support from the direct expenses that we're used to sort of touting as our program work. But there are a couple things that uh, we need to consider when we start looking at our um, programs more accurately and thinking of core mission support and our overhead as being at the center of our organizations. Is a, there's a couple things that happen if we um, look at our business models more accurately. And that is one is that we see very clearly that if we leave any part of our organization unfunded, it risks the very core of the organization for the rest of the organization. So think of it this way. This this graphic where you have programs one, two, and three, program two is the yellow and on the right of the screen there. Um, program two, in this case, is a program that has budgeted for a certain amount of expense and a certain amount of work to be done out in the world, a certain use of resources. But if we leave that program unfunded, you can see that not only are the, the two outer rings, the direct expenses shared by programs and the direct expenses that are specific to the program left unfunded, but also any time a program is not fully funded, we also have the entire core mission portion of the organization at risk because that piece of the organization is unfunded too. And this is just going to challenge our thinking that any time we think of a program, we want to make sure we think of it as fully funded or what are the consequences of it not being. And this is one of the places where we start to think that graphically it starts pulling our strategy in line with the math of it all. And so this gives us a whole different way of approaching our funders and partners, a very different way of managing our programs internally and, and sort of being ahead of the consequences of how we run them. And also knowing that we can't uh, afford to go about with our programs being underfunded because of the direct um, impact it has on the very core of our organization, which would, of course, affect sustainability, um, long-term um, goals and strategies, and the, ultimately the effectiveness of our mission. And then one other key aspect that this new graphic help us, helps us to communicate is when we go to funders, we know the temptation um, to really present what we think, at least by past standards, has been the most important piece of our work, which is always those two outer circles, the direct expenses shared by programs and the direct expenses that are program specific. And I think this is where, back to Gabe's point about that nonprofits, we do have a part in this. And I loved your anecdote about the person who went to their funders and just said, hey, you know, our core mission support piece costs about 25% and you're only paying us eight. And the funders just went, oh, well, goodness, we should pay the rest of it. I think if we start helping our funders, as well as our own staff and our management and our leaders and our, our uh, board members, realize what happens in this scenario. This is the scenario where we go to a funder and we ask for only the, the you know, what we thought maybe is the sexiest items or maybe the easiest sell items, which are those outer rings. And if they fund those portions, they leave a gap at the very core of the organization because they have not paid the share of the costs for the organization that are at the very core of it. So that core mission support idea, if we get those outer rings funded but haven't tended to the core, basically it's like an evil game of Jenga, right? We've been tapping sort of the bottom rungs of a Jenga set, that uh, wooden pile of uh, our stack of, of blocks. We've been tapping uh, each of the blocks off at the bottom because we don't want to have you know, too much expense paid out to overhead, but we start diminishing it to the point where it can collapse. And if you think of this 
graphic you're looking at here three-dimensionally, if that is the core of a sphere and we start leaving parts of it open, the sphere around it has the potential to collapse in on the organization. And I think that's one place where we need and can get out and um, spend a lot of time uh, with our funders and ourselves educating as to the real consequences of treating uh, overhead as something that's separate from our programs and not at the core of it or not fundamental to it. So that's basically the 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 sort of graphic story. We know that a, you know hopefully a picture is worth a thousand w words, and I think the response to this graphic has shown that. Um, I've been really heartened to see a lot of nonprofits across the country starting to use a graphic presentation of this um, for their own uh, annual reports, where they actually do put their numbers into this format. And we've we've been working out that. I already have a, a spreadsheet I can make available to folks as well that uh, you can actually sort of drop in the program expenses, shared program expenses, those core mission support um, expenses and come up with a graphic like this that is actually proportional, which is the cool part about this. For all of us CPAs out there, the fact that the math works is very gratifying. Um, but it also starts to get us to think differently about how our organizations are structured and then of course how that um, pushes us forward into the world because if we get our strategy built on the Earth is flat model, we're only going to get Earth is flat respond our results. If we get our strategies built around the Earth is round, a sphere, and uh, the core is very important to it, I think we start our strategies start to change, our our way of talking to our funders starts to change, and then we're all together trying to get. Um, our program and mission were, were pushed farther out into the universe the way this would work. So finally, just a couple things. Um, we do have lots of great resources where you can see this um, graphic and all the sort of supporting um, pieces that go with it on our website as well, nonprofitassistancefund.org. Um, we have everything from a program and or a budgeting tool for program and uh, true program cost allocations to the blog that uh, this graphic is based on and first was introduced to the world. And then of course we have lots of great videos out there. We have, I like to think of them as sort of, we have a whole set of videos that are sort of uh, schoolhouse rock for um, nonprofit accounting and finance. So they're out there too and they're a lot of fun to use. So that's the, the quick um, sort of, you know, take off from where Gabe left off and uh, give you a, a really very graphic and very useful tool to revision and re-talk or reform how we talk about um, overhead and, and uh, I think we can go a long way with that and getting out to the world both again changing how we think about it but then communicating that better to our funders and supporters. So back to you Matt. All right great thank you so much. So if, um, if Dave if you could unmute yourself we'll go ahead and hop into these questions. Now, um, gentlemen, as you can see, the, the questions are also in your um, questions module on your desktop there, so if you could read along with me. But I want to start uh, with Colleen's original question that we were, we were trying to discuss without the help of Kurt. Um, Kurt, could you go ahead and read her question and, and then kind of address that for her? This is for Colleen. Yes, it's the second one. All right, I'm not immediately finding it. It's okay, I can read it out. I can read it for you. So, so she's talking about um, true costs. Uh, can you clarify how indirect overhead is calculated when a significant portion of revenue and expenses are passed through to a contractor? Ah, that's a great question. So um, I can tell you that as uh, someone who um, runs, uh, you know, as the CFO of a nonprofit that has a couple of different parts of the organization that, that work very much like that. We, ha we are uh, an organization that has a loan fund, so we have a lot of loan capital that comes in that is, um, would certainly be parts of that are granted to us as equity capital that goes out to, to um, loans that we make to nonprofit borrowers. That money is not a direct program um, expense of ours. It's used as capital by our nonprofit clients and then repaid. So that comes in as revenue, but we don't consider that as an expense item, and certainly that one's actually receivable when it goes out. 
We also have fiscally sponsored organizations as part of a new merger that we are a part of, where we have um, grants that come in that are actually granted to us as the fiscal sponsor, but they are then directly regranted to a nonprofit or a startup organization may not even be a nonprofit yet. In fact, most aren't, and that's the point of the fiscal sponsorship. And then that money goes directly out to them, and they're the ones who then have incur the direct program expenses out there. So in either one of these cases, those amounts of money would skew our program budgets if they were included as direct expenses of a, of a program. So what we do instead is we have as the program expenses of both the lending program and the fiscal sponsorship program are actually our internal expenses that, that support those programs. So our um, staff and uh, meeting expenses and office operations and occupancy expenses and all the things that go into running a good program. So we, we hold those separate and uh, we think very um, appropriately so. We don't consider those more pass-through type revenues and expenses to be part of calculating the, the if you want to use that ratio at all, <laughs> um, you know, what, what people would consider as the indirect rate for those programs. Okay, great. Thank you so much for answering that. So um, I have a, a comment from um, Catherine. Um, she's talking about the uh, Form 990. Um, and she has a belief that uh, you know maybe no matter what we try visually and, and by reports that that form uh, helps to sustain the overhead mess. Does anybody want to comment on that and 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 how to fight that kind of, of legal doc that that tax document that's out there for everybody? Sure, yeah, I'm I'm happy to chat about that um, uh, at least to a certain degree. I'm the, the Form 990 does some good things. Um, from a, a sector perspective, it does equalize data to a certain degree. They're not always filled out correctly, um, so there can really be a problem with that, but it does at least set some standards across the sector. But really, it's just a document that was created to for the IRS to check a box and say, yes, you are indeed a nonprofit. It, does not lend to how effective your organization is. So we tried to more or less jerry-rig um, some sort of a, a rating system out of it. Uh, and what we came up with as a, as a sector, and GuideStar plays, you know, the, going back to the blue crayon thing, GuideStar does play a part in it, um, were, were, these, were these overhead ratios. And until we realized that as a sector, we need to move beyond those and we need to start distributing better information about our organizations, which is where GuideStar comes in, then we may somewhat be defined by those, those tax forms because they are so ubiquitous. Yeah, I think it's a great uh, great place for us to, to see some of our advocacy work going into the future because obviously, you know, there was a major uh, to sort of redesign of the 990 a few years ago. It's going to happen again. Uh, but I think uh, to Gabe's point, and certainly in Gabe, the way you and GuideStar have worked so um, much with us to try to come up with alternatives, I think that's our responsibility then. What could we start presenting as a different way of, of illustrating our various programs and all the expenses that go into supporting those that would be acceptable to the public, to the IRS, to our funders, to ourselves that would start to make sense. And I think if we can come up with a great alternative, and it could be around something like the model we just presented, but start to realize that we can back it up with real numbers. Um, as long as people can see a connection to, between looking at those numbers and results, I think we would have a chance to, to advocate for a different presentation, different set of ratios or a different set of um, numbers. Okay, great. All right, so Dan has a comment here. He sent me via chat. You all could comment on it for him. Um, some organizations have done a lot of allocating of overhead to program costs. This has been forced by government contracts, at least in his experience, and such things actually add additional expense to overhead by duplicating accounting entry, uh, entries. How do we work with organizations that contract nonprofits and, and limit the amount of overhead they may have? So it's part of the contract with the government entity, and they've, they've specifically put overhead in the contract. Don't everybody well, jump I, in on that. 
<laughs> no, no, I just say, so this is one of the things where hopefully I'm understanding the question correctly, and I'll respond very briefly, and then Gabe, please jump in too. But so one of the things that um, you know, working sort of in this world where you know I might say that uh, you know calling the old pie chart that the Earth is flat model, and then moving to a new one where we have sort of start thinking about core mission support and thinking at all those things that were called overhead at the core of our organizations is that we do find value in keeping track of true program costs as an organization, organization, regardless of who out in the world might be asking for it. Because when we know the true costs of a program, um, and then we start considering the relative investments in one program over another, we want to make sure that we consider all the costs that are involved in putting a program into play. And so um, even though I talk you know, adamantly about how we think of overhead, um, and how what people define it as and you know what can go wrong there I also think that keeping track of all those expenses that have been called overhead like really you know good strong strategic financial accounting expertise within the organization great human resources governance at a level that draws the best out of our governing structures all of those things are key to making our programs more expensive so I want to know how much those costs as well, but I don't see them as separate from our programs. I see them as part of it, and so I don't. I actually would argue that that uh, needing to keep track or allocate all those costs to our programs is a beneficial thing. Um, we just have to make sure we invest in getting the right infrastructure to do it well. Yeah, and I, I just would add that I think Kurt answered that um, probably better than I would be able to. But the, this, to me, it just goes back to the two things that I keep mentioning. And it's one, that we need to figure out how we're talking about this publicly and come up with a unified solution to that. And then we need to figure out from a financial and accounting perspective how, how, we're, how we're actually formulating the numbers behind this so that we have those apples to apples comparisons. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so Gabe, you're being put on the, I'm sorry, not Gabe, Kurt, you're being put on the spot here. Everybody wants access to your spreadsheet. Um, <laughs> how, okay. How would you, uh, you want me to post your uh, your email address here for everybody, or? <laughs> um, I think that's fair. If I, I can't bring up some great thing and dangle it out there and not, not make it available. So, yeah, yeah. And I'll, I'll let everybody know that it's, it's um, you know, you need a little bit of Excel savvy, but really it's just putting together some Excel charts that exist already within it, and uh, you can come up with some fantastic new graphics for your organization. Excellent. Okay, so I've just shared it with the uh, audience. Um, that's Kurt's uh, email address, and um, please feel free to shoot him a polite, brief email. I know we all get enough email as is, uh, requesting a copy of his stellar spreadsheet. Well, well, guys, that about does it for us. I appreciate uh, Gabe and Kurt for, for being part of our program today. I appreciate everybody for attending. Um, today's program wasn't worth any CPE credit or HRCI or SHRM credit as we typically do. Uh, we apologize for that. Um, we're going to try to make it up for you next month, uh, May 2nd. Uh, we have a three-hour uh, program. It'll be three separate webinars back to back to back. Actually, they're webcast. They'll be live broadcast uh, from a, our corporate headquarters in San Jose. Uh, there will be HRCI, SHRM, and CPE available. Uh, you'll see that uh, registration link in your email from us uh, later today. So please feel free to attend one, two, or all three, and we will see everybody on May 2nd. Uh, once again, thank you for being with us today. And Kurt and Gabe, I really appreciate your time. You guys did a great job. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you. It was great. All right. Thank you, guys. Everybody have a great week. Bye-bye.